The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor Thomas Goss, returning once again to the works of Lili Boulanger. Exactly 100 years have passed since this extraordinarily talented young composer died in March of 1918, and yet her music has remained fresh and compelling. In fact, I'd say that in some ways, her work feels like it was composed quite recently, with a highly personalized combination of craft and style similar to some of today's leading composers. Intense discipline being used in the service of a very free, elevated imagination. So far in this series of lessons, we've studied three of her fully orchestrated works, Vieille Prière Boudique, the Psalm 130 De Profundis, and Dum Matin de Printemps, all of which were composed following her win of the 1913 Prix de Rome for music. Today, let's jump back to 1912, which was a particularly rough year for Lily's health, despite her ongoing achievement as a student at the Paris Conservatoire. She'd successfully competed in the preliminary round of that year's Prix de Rome competition after being an official student for a few short months, only to collapse during her harmony examinations, leading to a long convalescence. The 1912 Prix de Rome competition continued without her into its final round, but the results from the remaining contestants were apparently so abysmal that no prize was awarded that year. Lily soldiered on, continuing her classwork from her sickbed when she couldn't attend school in person. By the end of the year, she'd composed her first serious large-scale work, Pour le Funeraille d'un Soldat. In character, the work was very much in keeping with the kind of music that Prix de Rome contestants were expected to compose, a cantata for soloist, chorus, and orchestra on a French poem. In this case, Lily Boulanger chose a text of the same name by the Romantic-era poet Alfred de Musset. This was no student exercise, but a fully mature composition. The teachers of the Paris Conservatoire recognized this and awarded it the Prix Le Paul, the highest honor that could be given to a student's coursework. Though Lily had missed her chance with the Prix de Rome that year, this piece's honors were as much to say that she might well have won it had she made it through the final round. Before we dive into some score analysis, let's look at Lili's orchestra, which is fairly standard for a French opera or tone poem of that time. Triple winds with standard auxiliaries, except for two flutes with no piccolo. B-flat clarinet and bass clarinet are perfect for Lili's choice of the very dark key of B-flat minor, which seems to have had symbolic significance in her vocal work. Note the use of sarousaphone rather than contrabassoon once again. The brass are also standard for that time four horns, two trumpets, three trombones, and tuba, with a very French addition of two cornets. We find cornets as standard in other works of that period, like The Sorcerer's Apprentice by Ducat, or Franck's Symphony in D minor. Interestingly, though the cornets are in their standard key of B-flat like the clarinets, the trumpets chosen are the lighter, brighter Cs, rather than the slightly heavier B-flats. The percussion is narrowly targeted for Lili's programmatic purposes. Three timpani tuned to F, B-flat, and E-flat, the dominant, the tonic, and the subdominant, one orchestral bell tuned to B-flat, drums and cymbals sharing a staff and probably a player, and tam-tam. The drum could be anything from a snare to a field drum. Lili probably intended a simple military drum, and this is what you tend to hear in recordings. Moving down the score, we see the obligatory two harps, plus baritone soloist, SATB choir, and strings. Don't be confused by this strange hybrid clef in the tenor part. 
looking like a treble clef with a tenor C clef attached to it. This is simply another form of sub-octave clef as you might have seen in tenor parts, indicating that the pitches sound an octave down. The added tenor clef symbol is showing more or less which written pitch sounds middle C, though the pointer of the symbol confusingly centers on D rather than C. Ricordi, the publisher of the 1919 public domain score that's currently available on IMSLP, once again gives you the names and layout of the score only at the beginning, after which you have to remember the instruments by their typical score position for the rest of the piece, with no abbreviated names on the following pages. As I've mentioned once or twice in previous lessons, the trick is to recognize certain conventions. The top three brackets and single staff representing the winds, the top bracket of brass representing the horns, the middle two single staves for the trumpets and cornets, and the bottom bracket for trombones and tuba. Watch out for that bottom bracket, because sometimes two staves can expand to three if the publisher feels that the third trombone needs its own staff. As to the percussion, you simply have to remember timpani, bell, drums and cymbal, tam-tam. The tam-tam and bell are hardly used, so you'll find your attention focused more on the timpani and drums anyway. Then, of course, the double grand staves of harp, single staff of the baritone soloist, bracket covering the chorus, and standard layout of the strings are all pretty easy to process visually. Now for some score analysis. For this lesson, I have to format the way that you listen to these score reading examples a little differently. There are two orchestral versions of Pour le Funeraille available on YouTube. The first is a beautifully recorded version by Mark Stringer with the Luxembourg Philharmonic which has very kindly been made available by Naxos. Then there are several different live videos made of an arrangement for a slightly smaller orchestra. With the exception of a tiny bit of intro and outro in this video under the Fair Use Doctrine, I am not going to take advantage of these recordings. Instead, here's a link to the Naxos version for your own listening. After I discuss each section, I'll provide a few seconds of screen with the pause symbol along with a time reference, so you can pause my video and listen to the relevant excerpt that goes with the page I've got up on screen. I realize this is a bit clumsier than my usual videos, and probably useless if you're using a smartphone, but these lessons really should be viewed on a big screen anyway. Sorry for the inconvenience, but this is the only way that I can share this particular work with you as an orchestration lesson, and it's crucial for understanding Lily Boulanger's development as a composer. From the very first page, we can see that the timpani and drum are going to be partners for most of the piece, playing unison in a slow military funeral tattoo. Lily balances the more prominent sound of the drum down a notch from the timpani, which is taking the place of a traditional bass drum for this slow march rhythm. Nevertheless, both parts are literally marked well-rhythmed. This will carry on for the entire introductory episode, and return again in later passages. The winds and horns enter at bar three, in imitation of a military marching band. When you hear the dense but resonant structure, you have to credit Lily's ear in capturing the essence of band scoring, while still adding some refinements of her own. In particular, notice the rich, slightly rough quality of the doubling of the top line of this opening chordal passage. English horn and first clarinet, then adding first oboe, and finally a very low first flute, which is almost inconsequential in this weak register. Also, listen for the solidity of the sarousophone or contrabassoon, and second bassoon on those low B flats, and the snarl of the stopped horns at their entrance, giving way to rounder, open chords in support of the climbing harmony. As you heard there, the heavy brass enter right at the peak of that arc in the winds and horns, with a chorale of their own, based on the rhythm of the percussion, once again with the indication of a well-marked rhythm. The tailing off winds and first horn merge seamlessly into the resonance of the brass by the second bar. The structure is a simple four-part harmony at first, with the first cornet doubling the first trumpet. Tuba and third trombone take over the low B-flat pedal tone, but this doesn't mean that the third trombone is necessarily intended to be a bass trombone. A low B-flat pedal tone is perfectly accessible for a tenor model, and the rest of the part is well within the tenor range. Listen for the little touch of cymbal and the flare of sinister color from stopped horn as the heavy brass reach the apex of their statement. Then how effortlessly Lily seems to cool the texture with the entrance of the strings, 
descending down to just a hint of the dies irae motive from harps and lower strings by the end of the page. The dovetailing of the winds taking over the brass's role in harmonic support is masterfully subtle, if carefully balanced by the conductor. At the entrance of the bass vocals, the lower strings take over the tattoo from the percussion, with arco cellos riding the low B-flat and pizzicato basses alternating octaves. The repeat bar marking is mostly intended to make instrument parts more readable, but as you can see here, it can find its way into full scores of concert music from time to time. The prevailing sound here is a rich unison of middle B-flat from first oboe and first horn, extremely penetrating even at a soft dynamic. In fact, even a great oboe player would struggle to keep the dynamic of their lowest note any softer than mezzo forte. Nevertheless, in this context, it's an extremely effective use of the oboe's bottom range, especially atop a dense mid-range stack of horns, clarinets, and bassoons. Heavy brass adds some bite by the middle of the passage, but quickly back off. Only a garishly rolled harp would make much impression against this thick texture. Notice how Lili marks unfinished ties in her brass and winds. Similar to a cymbal strike that's allowed to hang in the air instead of being damped, she wants those instruments to fade away instead of simply rounding off the note as per usual. I don't recommend imitating this yourself, it's clearer just to put diminuendo hairpins at the end of the bar, but it's interesting to note this marking. The scoring that follows is incredibly simple yet effective. Low B-flat octaves in sarousophone and fourth horn, remember that this is old horn notation with pitches sounding up a perfect fourth and bass clef, so that's a concert B-flat too dovetailing into the same notes on bass clarinet and alternating bassoons. But the sparseness of the elements only serves to make them more dramatic, the drums and timpani reacting to the continuing bass vocal part, with triple octave strings playing a full dies irae motive in response. The pedal B-flats continue for the rest of the passage in woodwinds, double basses, second harp, and timpani, the last of which maintains its teamwork with a military drum to a degree. The strings repeat the dies irae motive, and then start to develop it searchingly upward, as the same military wind scoring accompanies from below. By keeping the violins, violas, and cellos purely in melodic octaves, Lili achieves a distinct separation of roles between them and the winds and brass, as if the strings are the meaning and the emotion, and the winds and brass the physicality, the ritual function. All the same, a few of the winds help bulk up the string melody, including the flutes and first clarinet, and then the English horn joining in. There's more nicely realized band scoring toward the end of the passage, where oboes, clarinets, and muted horns take over the thematic role, echoing the strings. There's nothing unnecessarily scored, with the exception of first harp, whose delicate harmonics would be easily swamped by the winds and horns above it. Though this score is superbly professional in craft, Lily was still finding her way with the harp, but she'd master it fully by the next Prix de Rome. At the sudden jump to Allegro, we observe some of the functional logic in having a pair of cornets handy. It enabled French composers to score widely spaced heavy brass harmonies while freeing up the trumpets for featured lines. Here the cornets fill out the harmony above the trombones, tuba, and first and second horns, while the trumpets ring out in heralding octaves the return of the fallen hero. The brighter overall tone of this passage perfectly complements the higher, edgier tessitura of the tenor voices. So far, Lili has been carefully shaping each episode to match the exact meaning of its respective verse. Here the text reads, The soul will belong to God. The army will have the body. The soul is represented by rolling harp chords, soft strings, and a distant full chorus, with radiant winds and horns underlining the word God. The military is, of course, the brass section and energetic tenors, followed by loud full chorus. The featured trumpets play a rhythmic counterpart to the rest of the brass in a similar configuration to the previous page, locking neatly into the momentum of the choral scoring.
The last two verses are repeated now by softly chanting basses and tenors, as if an assembled crowd is repeating the words in prayer. The simple linear scoring resembles Gregorian chant, but Lily cautions that she wants strict time here, with a character both popular and sad, presumably without an overly sanctimonious attitude. The strings support the voices in very calm, plain doubling of the parallel octaves and fifths, with the upper winds and then the bassoons and horns joining in. Listen for the discreet touch of bell and tam-tam that comes slowly into the foreground, and then tolls ever louder at the end of the episode. Let's stop there for today. I'll bring you the second half of this piece next month, with more great choral writing, a standout baritone solo, and some superb instrumental scoring. Even though Lili only composed about a half dozen works for full orchestra, you can still see that her vision was unusually rich and colorful. She makes us feel the same excitement of exploration that she must have felt in her late teens and early twenties, for all the mastery of craft that she'd built on since her early childhood of tagging along to her sister Nadia's conservatory classes. I hope to share more of that with you soon.